Let's start with the unsettling and venture deep into the world of medieval medicine, a realm where the bizarre meets the barbaric. From the merely odd to the outright horrifying, we journey through 10 of the most bizarre medical practices of the Middle Ages. Number 10. Urine Diagnostics In medieval Europe, particularly in places like England and France, you would have inevitably encountered the peculiar art of urine diagnostics. This practice wasn't just a medical routine, it instilled both curiosity and dread. It was a cornerstone of medieval medicine, held in the same regard as the most sacred of rituals. This wasn't any ordinary diagnostic method. Picture a dimly lit apothecary, walls lined with jars of mysterious substances, and in the hands of the practitioner, a flask filled with the patient's urine. The urine flask, a vessel of insight, was as crucial to the medieval doctor as a sword to a knight. Here's where it gets intriguing. The flask was held aloft, swirled, and scrutinized with an intensity that would make a modern scientist balk. The color, smell, and sometimes disturbingly the taste of urine were all clues to unlocking the body's ailments. A greenish tint? A sign of too much bile. A foul odor? Perhaps a hint of a brewing fever? The logic behind this practice was steeped in the theory of the four humors. According to this belief, any imbalance in blood, phlegm, black bile, or yellow bile in the body could cause illness. Urine being a bodily excretion was thought to be a window into this delicate balance, or imbalance as it often turned out. But it wasn't all straightforward. The interpretations were often bizarre and left much to the imagination. Frothy urine? Surely a sign of internal tempests. Sediments? Undoubtedly remnants of a dissolving evil spirit. The diagnosis derived from such observations were as varied as they were outlandish. As we look back through the annals of history, urine diagnostics stands out as a dark and misguided art. A practice that combined equal parts superstition and pseudoscience, it reflects an era where the line between medicine and myth was blurred. It's a stark reminder of how far we've come into the world of science medicine, where thankfully, taste tests are no longer a part of the diagnostic process. Number 9. Leech Therapy Imagine stepping into a medieval healer's den, only to find your cure involves an encounter with slimy, blood-sucking leeches. In an age where the lines between science and mysticism were blurred, this practice was surprisingly widespread. Trusted by physicians across Europe, leech therapy was the go-to solution for everything from headaches to heart disease. The process was both unsettling and precise. The healer, often a mix between a sage and a sorcerer in the eyes of the common folk, would carefully select leeches, the squirming, slippery tools of the trade. With a steady hand, they were applied to the patient's skin, usually at strategic points believed to be the centers of bad blood or illness. Leech theory was grounded in the theory of humors. An imbalance of blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile was believed to cause all illness. Leeches, with their blood-sucking abilities, were thought to remove the excess of bad blood, thus restoring the body's natural balance. It was a gruesome yet fascinating dance between human and nature. For the patient, the sensation was as eerie as it was painful. The feeling of leeches latching onto the skin, their bodies swelling with blood, was enough to make even the bravest souls squirm. The dread of the procedure often weighed as heavily as the illness itself, with many patients enduring this ordeal in the hopes of a cure. In retrospect, leech therapy is a vivid illustration of medieval medicine's attempts to heal, often blurring the lines between harm and cure. While it may seem barbaric to us now, it was a sincere albeit misguided effort to understand and treat the mysteries of the human body. It reminds us of how far we've come in the understanding and practice of medicine, where leeches are now a more a relic of the past than a feature of the present. Number 8. Bloodletting Step into the medieval world and you'll find that draining one's blood was not a cause for alarm, but a common treatment. Bloodletting was a practice as widespread as it was revered, believed to cure ailments ranging from the common cold to the most mysterious of fevers. In the hands of a barber surgeon, equipped with an array of sharp lancets and leeches, the procedure of bloodletting was both an art and a science. With practiced precision, these practitioners would cut into a patient's vein, allowing the bad blood to drain out, often into a measured bowl, making the quantity of blood lost. This practice was deeply rooted in the belief of balancing the four humors, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. It was thought that most illnesses were caused by an excess of blood, leading to an imbalance in these humors. Thus, by removing blood, the body's natural balance could supposedly be restored. For patients, bloodletting was a harrowing experience, fraught with both fear and hope. 
the sight of blood draining from one's body, the feeling of growing weakness, and the barber surgeon's solemn demeanor often made the procedure as psychologically taxing as it was physically. Patients clung to the hope that this loss of blood would be their gain in health. Today, bloodletting is seen as a reminder of our medical past, a practice that straddled the line between harm and healing. It stands as a stark example of medieval medicine's rudimentary understanding of the human body and disease. A practice once considered essential, now a testament to the evolution of medical science and our continued quest for understanding the complexities of human health. Number 7. Mandrake Root Anesthesia In the medieval era, if you needed surgery, your anesthetic might come from the ground, not a vial. Mandrake Root, with its human-like shape and mystical reputation, was the anesthetic of choice. This peculiar plant was as famous for its use in potions and witchcraft as it was in medicine. Administering mandrake root was a task shrouded in ritual and danger. The root, which was believed to scream when pulled from the earth, was ground into a powder and mixed into various concoctions. Patients would consume or inhale these mixtures, leading them into a deep, often hallucinogenic sleep, dulling their senses to the pain of surgery. Mandrake's use was steeped in a blend of folklore and early medical theory. It was thought to have mystical properties, capable of numbing pain and inducing sleep. The root's human-like form only added to its mystique, with many believing it had special powers over the body and mind. For patients, the experience of mandrake anesthesia was akin to stepping into the unknown. The sensations of falling into a deep, unnatural sleep, coupled with vivid dreams and hallucinations, made the experience as terrifying as the ailment itself. The fear of never waking up or losing one's mind was a real concern for those undergoing the procedure. Mandrake root anesthesia stands as a fascinating example of medieval medicine's intersection with folklore and early pharmacology. It highlights the lengths to which humanity has gone to find relief from pain, often treading the fine line between healing and harm. This practice, rooted in both myth and necessity, serves as a reminder of our perpetual journey to understand and alleviate human suffering, sometimes in the most unusual of ways. Number 6. Mummy Powder In the Middle Ages, the line between medicine and the macabre was often blurred, and nowhere is this more evident than in the use of mummy powder. This wasn't the plot of a horror story, but a real remedy sought after across Europe. Ground-up mummies, believed to hold magical healing properties, were a prized ingredient in the medieval medical cabinet. The process of creating mummy powder was as grisly as it sounds. Ancient mummies, often plundered from Egyptian tombs, were ground into a fine powder. This powder was then mixed into potions, salves, and even ingested directly. It was hailed as a cure-all, believed to heal everything from wounds to internal ailments. The fascination with mummy powder stemmed from a blend of the era's fascination with ancient civilizations and a deep-seated belief in the supernatural. Mummies, with their mysterious preservation and connection to the afterlife, were thought to possess powerful healing and protective qualities. For patients, the use of mummy powder was a testament to their desperation for a cure. The thought of consuming a potion made from ancient remains was both awe-inspiring and unsettling. There was a dual fear, the fear of the illness itself and the fear of the unknown, of ingesting something so intimately connected with death. Number 5. Toothworm Theory In the shadowy world of medieval medicine, even toothaches were a source of myth and mystery. The toothworm theory was not just a theory, but a widely accepted explanation for dental pain and decay. Dentists of yore believed that tiny worms, invisible to the eye, burrowed into teeth, causing agony and ruin. Treating toothaches in medieval times was a mix of incantations, rituals, and rudimentary dentistry. The treatments, if they could be called that, ranged from chanting spells to lure the worm out, to applying noxious concoctions to the affected tooth. In more extreme cases, the tooth was simply yanked out with the hope of removing the offending worm. This bizarre theory was rooted in a time where the lines between magic and medicine were indistinguishable. The tooth worm was seen as a living entity, a malevolent creature responsible for dental suffering. It was a belief that transcended cultures, found in texts from Europe to Asia, a testament to the shared human quest to explain the unexplainable. For the medieval sufferer, a toothache was more than just physical pain. It was an encounter with an unseen enemy. The fear of these mystical worms caused as much distress as the dental ailment itself. Society viewed toothaches as battles with a minuscule yet formidable foe lurking within, making every bite and every smile a venture into the unknown. The toothworm theory in its oddity and simplicity paints a vivid picture of medieval life and thought. 
It's a narrative that illustrates how our ancestors grappled with the mysteries of the human body using the limited knowledge and abundant imagination they had. While we may smile at the quaintness of this belief, it's a powerful reminder of the journey of human understanding, a journey that has taken us from fearing mythical creatures in our teeth to exploring the complexities of dental science with precision and clarity. Number 4. Astrology-Based Treatments In medieval medicine, healing was written in the stars. Physicians turned to celestial bodies, believing their positions and movements influenced human health. It was an era where an ailment could be blamed on a misaligned planet as much as bodily imbalances. Medical decisions from choosing the right day for surgery to picking herbs were guided by astrology. The zodiac was as important as the medical text, with doctors consulting star charts alongside their patients, seeking cosmic advice for earthly ailments. This approach to healthcare was mystical yet commonplace. Patients accepted that their well-being was tied to the heavens, viewing diseases as signs of celestial discord. Healing meant realigning one's health with the universe, not just treating the body. Astrology-based treatments highlight a time when the universe's mysteries intertwined with medical practice, showing our ancestors' efforts to harmonize human health with cosmic rhythms. This historical curiosity underscores the evolving journey of medicine, from starry interpretations to evidence-based treatments. Number 3. Animal Dung Ointments In an age where antibiotics were centuries away, medieval medicine often took a turn for the unorthodox. Among these, using animal dung in medical treatment stands out for its sheer audacity. This was not just a farmer's old wives' tale, but a widespread practice among healers and physicians. The rationale behind this peculiar treatment was grounded in the belief that animal dung, particularly from certain pure animals like cows or sheep, had healing properties. It was commonly mixed with herbs and applied to wounds, sores, and even used in poultices to treat various ailments. The idea was that the dung would draw out impurities and promote healing. For the medieval patient, being slathered with dung ointments was a test of faith in their physician's wisdom. It was a grim choice between suffering from an ailment or enduring a repulsive treatment. The discomfort and revulsion were often as challenging to overcome as the physical symptoms of their illnesses. Animal dung ointments, while startling to our modern sensibilities, offer a glimpse into the desperate lengths to which medieval medicine would go in the pursuit of healing. It reflects an era of trial and error, where the lines between helpful and harmful remedies were often blurred. Number 2. The Four Humors Theory In the medieval mindset, health was all about balance, specifically the balance of four bodily fluids, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. This theory wasn't just a footnote in medical textbooks, it was the foundation of medieval healthcare, influencing everything from diagnosis to treatment. The theory held that each humor was linked to specific temperaments, seasons, and even elements. Imbalances in these humors were thought to cause illness. Treatments, therefore, focused on restoring balance, often through diet, lifestyle changes, and more extreme measures like bloodletting or purging. Living under the four humors theory meant viewing one's health through a lens of balance and harmony. Patients were often subject to a regimen of strict diets and uncomfortable treatments, all in the name of rebalancing their humors. It was a holistic, albeit misguided approach to health, intertwining physical symptoms with emotional and environmental factors. The Four Humors Theory stands as a testament to the human effort to understand and systematize the workings of the body. While archaic and inaccurate by modern standards, it was a significant step in the evolution of medical thought, predating our current understanding of physiology and disease. Number 1. Trepanation Topping our list is perhaps the most astonishing of all medieval medical practices. Imagine a time when drilling a hole in the skull was not the stuff of horror movies, but a legitimate medical treatment. Trepanation, the act of boring holes in the skull, was a procedure as radical as it was risky, performed to treat a variety of ailments, from headaches to mental disorders. The process of trepanation involved the careful removal of a piece of the skull using a trephine, a specialized surgical tool. The belief was that this procedure would relieve pressure in the head, allow evil spirits to escape, or even cure brain diseases. It was a testament to the medieval doctor's bravery, or audacity, and the patient's desperation for relief. For patients, undergoing trepanation was an ordeal of unimaginable proportions. The idea of having one's skull opened while fully conscious, as anesthesia was not an option, was terrifying. Yet many submitted themselves to this procedure out of sheer desperation or faith in their physician's wisdom. It was a stark choice between living with debilitating pain or risking it all for the chance of a cure. 
Trepanation stands as the pinnacle of extreme medieval medical practices. This practice, shocking as it may be, sheds light on the bold, albeit unrefined steps taken in the early journey of neurological understanding. It underscores the fact that, throughout history, the pursuit of healing has often pushed the boundaries of knowledge, courage, and endurance.